Ladies and gentlemen, welcome uh, to this panel entitled The EU is the Outlier of the Fourth Industrial uh, Revolution. My name is Martin Michelot. I am the Deputy Director of the Europeum Institute for European Policy, a Czech think tank, which, as the name indicates, works on uh, European policy. And I'm very proud that Europeum is a partner uh, of this panel, and I really want to thank the Warsaw Security Forum and the Kazimir Pulaski Foundation for the, uh, for the partnership. We've been blessed with one of the widest topics that this conference actually is, uh, is, is discussing, and we only have one hour uh, to do so. So I'm just going to extremely quickly define uh, what we are talking about and what is at stake for those who may be wondering what you are currently go what you are going to, uh, to listen to. So the fourth industrial revolution, I'm just going to break the suspense, is actually ongoing. Uh, and it's considered to have started in the early uh, knots. It's also non known as the digital revolution, and it combines uh, technological and human capacities in an unprecedented way through self-learning algorithms, self-driving cars, human-machine interconnection, and big data analytics. Like its forerunners, the fourth revolution is generating both enormous economic potential and fears about the changes that are involved. These fears are being harbored not only by workers across Europe, but also by governments, which are perhaps uncertain about how to respond. And this, by extension, pre uh, presents a formidable challenge to EU policymakers, since only after a successful transformation of European industry in general, or of the manufacturing industry in particular, can Europe's competitiveness in the future uh, be ensured. And to uh, discuss these uh, very, very interesting topics, we really have uh, a fantastic panel today. In alphabetical, alphabetical order, we have Carl Bildt, who is the chairman of the Council of the European Council on Foreign Relations, was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Sweden from 2006 to 2014. Carl Bildt, please, if you can join the, uh, the, the panel. We have Martina Larkin, who is the head of Europe uh, and member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum. Martina, please, you can join us. Uh, yes, we can clap, it's true. Uh, we have uh, Pavel Svimboda, who is a deputy head of the European Political Strategy Center uh, of the uh, European Commission. And we have Pavel Wojciechowski, the chief economist of the Social Insurance Institution uh, and who was Minister of Finance of Poland uh, in 2006. So let's start by giving a big round of applause to all our panelists who are coming to discuss a quite complex topic today. And thank you to all of you for, for being here. So uh, I will go uh, directly to, uh, to, to, to Martina. Um, the World Economic Forum is a thought leader uh, on, on this topic. And when preparing for this panel, I've seen, I've read a lot of interesting publications for your site. So I first of all want to thank you uh, in a very large extent for participating in the vulgarization of this extremely uh, important topic. Um, and I just want to start us off with a, a very general uh, question. If you could please share with us your view on how the fourth industrial revolution is actually affecting uh, major global trends. And also if you could perhaps comment on the societal and political readiness of uh, the, the EU governments, but also governments uh, across the world to face the, the challenges brought forth by the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, it's great to be here. And yes, as you mentioned, this is a topic that occupies uh, us quite for quite some time and will also for the future. And I think as we think about the fourth industrial revolution and its impact, it's important also to, to see the context of it and that this is not solely a geopolitical or economic development, but really truly also a societal one. And that we're seeing um, a transformation of society and, and a move away from what we traditionally perhaps seen much more of a, a, a society of consumption and production into something completely new and, and different. And we're seeing our economic and political systems being completely transformed from what we have traditionally known. And I think that's where where the concerns come in or, or the questions come in and, and sort of the work of our teams is really much, much uh, um, concentrated on, on what that impact is and what it means. So on the economic front, of course, we have a huge um, question mark around labor markets and what the future of jobs looks like, which is a huge uh, question, also one that has driven um, the, the rise of, to a certain extent of populism and the fear of people of being left behind and you know uncertainties about their jobs and how, how the labor market would look like in, in the future. The question around productivity 
and how productivity will look like in the future and how we measure it. How do we measure competitiveness in the future? We have just released our competitiveness report, which is a new, has now a new methodology, which is much more based on readiness and preparedness for the fourth industrial revolution. And one of the key um, aspects of this is how can nations deal with innovation and how can they really um, create ecosystems that foster innovation and growth in a different way than what we have seen traditionally. Um, we also are working a lot on the question of not only a multipolar world, also multi um, conceptual world, which means that we have increasingly different viewpoints on values and identities and how political systems or economic systems should be built um, with the rise of China, but also other actors in the world. And of course, uh, the increasing sort of decline of, of US interests in, in international affairs that uh, raises huge questions of what is that new conceptual world that we actually look at. And when we think about values, uh, where do they come from and who is going to design this new value system? Who is going to design the ethical guidelines in a world of the fourth industrial revolution when it comes to, for example, data access or data management, um, AI, etc which China is extremely strong in. So those are some of the key aspects, I would say. And then, of course, we have the question around sustainability and how do we deal with a more circular economy where you know, we try to really respect also the resources and the constraints on resources that we have on, on this planet. And going back to the jobs front, I think this is another aspect that we work on and emphasize a lot. This in the future, it's not going to be about capital um, anymore, and you know, it's not going to be those who have the most uh, resources or, or money necessarily, but it's going to be who has the talent, and we, we sort of see a shift from capitalism to talentism, as we call it, but this aspect of who has the most talented workforce and talented um, society will be much more of a differentiating factor than who has the most money or has the biggest, sort of largest uh, resources in the future. So these are some of the kind of key things that we're seeing globally as, as major trends and things that are being driven through the fourth and last revolution. And your question on what the EU could or sh should do, um, a lot of it comes down when you think about the government about agile governance and developing much more agile governance frameworks because these developments are so complex and so rapid that traditional mechanisms and of, of legislation, the frameworks and regulation really are not no longer adapt to, to this reality. The second part is um, around you know, more flexibility, particularly when we talk about the EU. This sort of standard response of more EU or more of the same, I think, you know, has, has reached certain limits, particularly also in this part of the world. <laughs> and it's something I think that the EU should really uh, deal with and, and look at, particularly when it comes to issues that there's you know, a lot of agreement that the EU should take more leadership, like on migration, on security, on defense, or even on climate. It could be a strong, not only regional player, but also global player, and I think that should be discussed, how this could be formed in the future. And then, of course, when it comes to all the technological aspects, AI, data, self-driven cars, all of these uh, technologies that are being driven through the fourth industrial revolution, the EU needs to be much more assertive globally also. And we need to have a more coherent and consistent and collaborative approach within the EU on how we deal with this. So it shouldn't be just the Germany's AI center or model. It shouldn't just be France's, but it should be really on, also on, on an EU or even Europe uh, level that there needs to be certain stance and approach to how we benefit and how our society can benefit from these developments, not just be sort of a, 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 a passerby or sort of standby uh, to this. Thank you very much for, for kicking us off with, with this. I mean, there's a lot uh, to, to chew on, on on what you said, but you've actually uh, provided me the, the perfect transition because you said it shouldn't be only uh, Germany uh, or France. Uh, and this is where I want to, to turn to, uh, to Pavel uh, Wojciechowski. Uh, actually, I would have, to a very certain extent, a, a very similar uh, question for you than I had for, uh, for Martina Larkin. Uh, and I really want to ask you, um, can, 
Can you please tell us also, given your experience, uh, to what extent you view the fourth industrial revolution uh, as a source of growth? Who are the main beneficiaries of it? What, which countries, which people, which actors? But also, if you could put a little bit of a focus uh, on, on Central Europe, uh, because obviously we are, uh, we are in Warsaw. Uh, this, the, the Visegrad group is very interested in the benefits of the digital single market. Uh, this is perhaps the region uh, of, of, Euro, of, of Europe which gains to lose, but also perhaps to win the most uh, from, uh, from, such a, from such a revolution. So please, if you could walk us through uh, how you see this from, uh, from your perspective. Uh, but also, of course, we very much welcome your, your overall global view. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm so happy to, to be in this distinguished panel. Uh, and uh, well, uh, as, uh, as, um, as was said before, we looking at, uh, at we have to put it in perspective, looking for, in general, looking for sources of growth. I mean, usually we understand that technology brings growth. And that is an ongoing uh, idea, but you know, some people say, like uh, there was a paradox of Solo, he said, you can see computers everywhere, but you don't know how to, uh, what, is the, what is the added value to the productivity. So the problem is that uh, to catching up this effect, and uh, when you discuss the revolution, uh, the biggest even revolution I think uh, happened in, in today's, uh, today actually, when, when Paul Romer got the Nobel Prize uh, for, he, for his own theory that he said that there is a special, I would say, indigenous, I mean, we call it indigenous growth theory, that the gene of technology is inside uh, the model of growth. And instead of uh, former ideas that you'd have a decreasing return of new investments when you advance your economy, uh, and therefore that's an, then you're, therefore you're looking for a new you know, countries to invest because over there you have a catching up effect and convergence effect, he said that can happen the opposite. So the richer countries can get richer and the poorer countries get poorer. And that was all about the, uh, the, the last year, uh, uh, the fractured world uh, in the global economy. Uh, so he said, uh, by increasing investments in richer countries, by fulfilling certain conditions, such as you know, scale uh, of, the, of, of the market, uh, specialization, uh, capabilities, uh, you can actually increase the returns even faster and in fact uh, winner takes it all. At the same time you have the fears of displacement of workers but inside the country. So people fearing of loss of jobs, that's an effect of destructive effect, you know, already described by Keynes, he said there's a destructive effect of loss of a job. The net, net effect of new jobs being formed and all jobs disappearing, it's negative. So most of those countries would lose their jobs. All the countries would lose their jobs because of technology. The question is, what would be the capitalization effect by the productivity growth? And you can catch up this by having what many economists say is capability. And capability is a certain word that, coming back to your question about CEs, that we might have and might not have. One good thing about uh, CE countries is that we are part of the European Union. So we're part of the supply chain. We are questioning only the, the fact that we maybe are not in the highest level of so-called value-added chain. So we are not getting the most value-added, okay? Maybe, but the, the full uh, employment increase that happened in Central Europe, European countries is because of the new, um, the new industry sectors that developed within the supply chain, which is mainly uh, due to the, uh, to the structure of industry and not in so much in services. So we can actually, if we increase the capabilities, uh, which comes down to the uh, good policies and good institutions, we can catch up and we can grab more of this value and we can benefit from this digital transformation. If not, uh, and we will try to say, well, we could be somewhere else or we have a different policy, of, uh, of what say, you know, we don't care about it and we don't invest in uh, human capital and we don't invest in, uh, in, uh, in technology or innovation. 
we are pretty much uh, we are we probably would be um, would be in trouble. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski. Um, I want to turn uh, now to uh, Pavel uh, Schwemboda because the, the EU uh, was discussed a bit, uh, competitiveness was, uh, was, was discussed, and uh, I want to uh, ask you, uh, Pavel, basically how can the objectives of, of competitiveness, of strengthening the scientific base, of enhancing social cohesion uh, be achieved together? Because this was, uh, to a very large extent, uh, discussed here. Uh, just considering, for example, the potential conflict between uh, research excellence and territorial cohesion within uh, within the EU, which Mr. Wojciechowski uh, very, very, uh, you know, uh, adroitly uh, mentioned. And uh, my my last sub-question uh, to this is, how does this play in the next multi-annual financial framework? Because we're already starting to see tensions on, uh, on, on certain priorities. And uh, of course, the, the question is, uh, will certain countries perhaps uh, push in one direction or, or, or another? Thank you. OK, thank you so much, Martin. So I want to uh, zoom in from uh, the global, perhaps, um, onto the European and then uh, national and, and regional. Because um, at the global level, we are uh, in a fierce uh, competition um, in a new phase of globalization, which is much more uh, data-driven, of course. Um, and, uh, and Europe has a certain uh, attitude to, to data which is not uh, always conducive uh, towards uh, value creation, and we need to turn that around. And I think the idea to turn that around is to build a, a high-protection um, environment uh, in which business models are based on high level of protection of people's privacy. Um, it's, it's a high-risk, high-reward type of project, I think. Um, um, high-risk because, of course, the, uh, the Americans and the Chinese uh, have no scruples about sharing data, so uh, I mean, the Chinese even less than, than the Americans, uh, so hence uh, the, their business models are, are thriving uh, in the consumer field. Uh, now, once the, the digital enters more firmly, and AI in particular, um, the, um, the field of activity which has to do with, um, with social uh, challenges uh, in areas such as health and education. I mean, this is where privacy will, will matter much more than it has uh, before. Uh, so we have this high level of protection now in, in the EU after uh, the entry into force of GDPR. Next challenge is to make sure that there are uh, thriving business models on this basis. And I think there are some uh, very promising signals to that effect, uh, but more uh, of that needs to be, uh, needs to be encouraged. Um, so that's the global level where, where we need to have a competitive edge and we need to build our own model of innovation in other, in other words. Um, now at, at the European level, I think one needs to look at where, where the problems lie and, and key problems for productivity, not only in Europe, more broadly in OECD countries have to do with the fact that there are two tier firms, uh, there are the high performers uh, and there are laggards. Um, uh, so there, are, there is a certain number of high productivity firms which are doing perfectly well and there is a lot of laggards. Uh, and in Europe there's also a lot of zombie firms uh, because we had very conducive environments uh, for years with monetary easing in particular for these zombie firms to, to survive. So that's one of our problems. Uh, the second uh, challenge has to do with uh, falling business dynamic. So there is simply much less economic churn um, than, than there used to be. So we need to address uh, these problems in parallel and the way to do so is to invest uh, even more heavily in value creation, in, in uh, the creation of technology. And we are putting forward the proposal now to sizably increase investment in research and development in digital. It's about 120 billion euro in the next financial uh, perspective of the EU starting 2021. That's the proposal. If you include R&D and digital altogether, this is a sizable um, uh, amount of money. So that's uh, technology creation. There's obviously technology diffusion. And there is uh, um, making it easier for the entry and exit of firms, uh, because we still struggle with that uh, very basic type of uh, business dynamic. Um, and you asked me about the, the cohesion aspect. Um, and this is pretty tricky because we, we tended to assume um, um, a decade ago that the diffusion of technology would do wonders. 
uh, namely that with the technology based on the internet, you could be living anywhere you want, and you could tap into the global economy, which is indeed what you can do, but somehow people tend to clock together in places, in cities, where, uh, where there is more talent. So talent attracts talent, uh, and uh, people tend not to like to live uh, in the rural areas. Uh, and has this, um, this miraculous logic of the diffusion of technology doesn't, doesn't work on its own. So we need to give it a helping hand. Um, and the helping hand in, uh, in the EU uh, has been called smart specialization, uh, which uh, basically aims at identifying the assets of given regions and, uh, and giving people uh, and strengthening people's potential to exploit these assets. And there is now a new concept uh, which refers to place-sensitive policies, which economic geographers in particular uh, appeal for, um, which goes further in the same direction. Namely, yes, you identify the assets, but you also need much more top-down level um, intervention in order for these local assets to be, to be exploited properly. And I think that is a very encouraging direction of travel. Thank you very much. Um, you you ended by talking about uh, about about value uh, creation uh, and uh, one industry that uh, is uh, very competitive in value creation is actually the the defense industry. And uh, uncoincidentally, we are sitting at a defense and security uh, conference. So I actually wanted to end uh, by uh, asking uh, Carl Bild uh, about this. Um, my question is basically. What about defense? Uh, we know the example of, uh, of, of DARPA in the United States, but uh, I think the, the, the question is also how can we harness some of the effects of the technological, uh, technological advances uh, in the defense sector and also build them uh, into the efforts that we currently see in the field of common security and, and defense policy. And basically, should there be, when we talk about the European Defense Fund, should there be, when we talk about the defense uh, planning processes, uh, some sort of integration uh, of, the, uh, of the advances uh, of the Fourth Industrial Revolution? And perhaps I could also ask you, is this a responsibility of the, of, of the member states, or uh, do we need, uh, basically, a bigger input from the, uh, from the private sector and from the defense companies? Thank you very much. I think basically the answer to all of your questions is yes. Uh, but to expand slightly on that. Um, first, I agree with World Economic Forum no, normally on most things, but not on this one. In the sense, <laughs> don't look that worried. Um, I don't think this is the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's the end of the industrial revolution and the beginning of the digital age. I think it's far bigger than just another version, another part of the Industrial Revolution. I think we are, if we do comparison in historical terms, we are now in the digital era where the industrial world was in the 1820s. Second generation of the steam engine. And as all of us know, there were quite a number of things coming after the second generation of the steam engine. Uh, the people in the 1820s had very, very little idea of that, and we don't have that either. This is going to be far more transformative in every single sector than just transforming industry. So I, just, I want to augment, rather, what the WEF is saying. That's even bigger in terms of uh, the impact that it's uh, going to have. Then on the security aspects of it, um, outside here, uh, you see the different firms having sort of the hardware stuff um, that is useful for territorial defense. I'm all in favor. We need to spend more on that. But I would argue that much like the Industrial Revolution changed warfare, the digital one will change it even more. Because you can destroy societies without having a single soldier crossing the border. You can have all of your artillery, all of your tanks, all of your aircraft, none of them is touched. The destroy, you can collapse the society anyhow by exploiting the digital vulnerabilities that might be there. So defense in the digital age is digital defense, not of the borders, they are fairly relevant, but of every single device and every single function that we have in our societies. If I look at, and I said, said we are just in the beginning of it, just to illustrate this with some of the things that happened in the last, uh, well, last year. Uh, which uh, I guess some of you will be familiar with, on how sort of 
the digital conflict is there all the time, uh, as we speak, and is unpredictable, and is rapidly evolving. The Vanakry virus, which nearly took down the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. Uh, that was not an attack directed against the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. It was a cyber weapon, or partly a cyber weapon, developed by the National Security Agency of the United States. But the problem with these particular weapons are, of course, that they are fairly, you can steal them, you can hack them, they can be leaked. And this particular one was leaked and was taken over by the North Koreans, who tampered with it and released it. And if released it in the cyber world, you don't really know where it ends up. And it ended up nearly taking down the national health system of the United Kingdom. I mean, that's one example of what happened. The next thing we had last year was the NetPetya attack, which is even more interesting. Because that started uh, part of the ongoing Russian attempts to uh, test weapons for destructions in, um, in Ukraine. And that's ongoing. Uh, and they have been closing down power systems and things like that, as you know, a couple of different times. Uh, in this particular case, um, it, it became inserted in a service company in Odessa. And that service company had a contract with Mask, which is the, I think, the biggest or the second biggest container or shipping company in the world. And um, it went into the mask system. And it closed down every one of the container terminals in the world. Every one of the container terminals in the world were closed down. We had hundreds of millions of dollars ticking every day uh, because of just the fact that this was proliferated out of an attack that was directed by the Russians against Ukraine and then happened to go into a machine that was connected to another machine that was connected to a global network that wasn't sufficiently protected. These are two known examples. There are others that are not known. And, and, and uh, these are accidental attacks, but it also illustrates the fact that you can, be, you can be hurt by something that is not directed against you. There can be a cyber conflict between the United Emirates, Arab Emirates, and Qatar that takes down the power system of Poland if you are not sufficiently protected. But then there are also the very aggressive operators, Russia, China, who insert things into your systems that are dormant there. That's happening. That can be activated at a given time to destroy the systems. And even more dangerous, that inserts in the system, not in order to destroy them, but to tamper with the integrity of the data. That's even worse. You think that the systems are operating normally, but they aren't. Because some of the data has been tampered with in some small way that might be difficult to detect originally, but makes everything go haywire somewhat further down the line. So this means that um, if I take it uh, sort of in more defense terms, 1925, uh, after the First World War, a lot of sort of reforms of military and disarmament, Sweden took a decision to set up an air force because we had decided or we had seen that sort of airplanes could be something and the Navy guys couldn't do it and the Army guys couldn't do it, so we set up an air force. I think we will all be setting up a new branch of defense, and that is cyber defense, which will be even more important than armies, navies, or air forces. And in contrast to these, we'll not necessarily defend the borders but must be de defend every single part of our society. Then, where are we Europeans on this? Well, we are, as has been said, we are we're somewhat behind. <laughs> uh, if you compare it with the, the Americans and the Chinese, I mean, China now spends as much on research and development as Europe does, and they are increasing much faster. We have not reached the target that we have for research and development spending in Europe. It is excellent that the commission is now expanding, but that's the commission, which is good money, big money. But the member states, not all of them, uh, are there. And if you just take the area of the defense spending to come back to that finally, a figure that I find staggering is that if you take the combined spending on defense research by the 27 member states, I take out the UK, the research spending of Amazon is 50% larger than the defense research spending of the 27 member states of the European Union. 
that indicates that we have some way to go in understanding of the magnitude of the change and in the magnitude of spending that is going to be necessary in order to educate and stimulate the brains that at the end of the day is going to do the work. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've had a very, very wide range of, of presentations and, and points of views on this on, you know, going from the more global picture, the European level, the central European level, the defense level, and I think this was fantastically uh, complimentary. First of all, I want to invite uh, the panel to react on one another's uh, comments uh, if, if they would wish to do so. Is there any? Yes, please. We want to pick up on the uh, World Economic Forum, uh, the words of uh, uh, Mr. Charles Schwab, who said it's not about technology. Uh, so it's all about. And I think that's, uh, what it's all about is about people. I mean, this is what I, I think. And uh, because there is, is a lot of social and psychological effects uh, that are happening, social at the level of society, psychological on the level of in ordinary people, and the companies, they have to deal with that. Uh, so, one, we discussed already the labor market disruption. Uh, that's one element. Uh, well, if it comes that uh, some people have uh, high paying jobs, others don't have any jobs, it's a question of basic, uh, universal basic income. Rather than giving them something, so they're not the losers and the beneficiaries of the first state. That comes to mind the issue of inequalities, growing inequalities worldwide, and the huge potential for migration waves, the caravan, you know, going from Central, uh, Central America to the United States, like today's, you know, element of that, is driven by the difference of incomes. It's not a question of GDP per capita, it's just, just, just a drive, a huge drive. It has to be uh, addressed. Fears of people, uh, pe people uh, fearing uh, being uh, on one side being uh, losing the jobs, but also fearing of uh, being at one time connected, but dehumanized at the same time, but I would say Frankenstein type of science development of technology, that they become, uh, you know, dealing with uh, not robots only, but a combination of robot and humans, which is cyborgs. Um, there is also companies that fear of being left out and missing out. In the world economy, they are fearing that uh, demand-driven sharing economy will push them away because they will not be able to adjust to the new trends, to the new structure of, uh, of economy, to the new challenges. At the same time, issues of uh, sharing responsibilities. Who's responsible for the, you know, Mr. Baxter, uh, a robot who would drop you know, uh, the 500 uh, kilo on your foot. Is it, is it the inventor? Or is it the one who, who programmed Mr. Baxter? Or is it somebody else? Who will take a responsibility for that? So sharing space between the robots and humans, is another challenge. And there's plenty of other challenges. The cyber issues, uh, cyber attacks, the security issues that it is, very relevant one, I don't want to discuss more, but of course, we are all concerned. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wojciechowski. Just before I give you the floor, I just want to also uh, encourage our, uh, our audience to already start thinking uh, of questions, because after you, we will go to the, the, the question and, and answer session, please. Yeah, I just wanna um, react to some of the comments and uh, clarify that certainly we do not see the fourth industrial revolution as just a technological or a digital revolution, but and not even just the you know, geopolitical power shifts move or anything like that, but truly a transformation of societies. And we see, we, we truly believe that um, we are seeing one society moving on to the next one. And uh, to Carl's point, we, I don't think we know yet where we're going. Um, I think there's a lot of questions open what that will look like and what it will mean um, to society, to the economy, to, to a lot of the things that we, we do and how we interact with each other, how we, we work, you know, how, how we live our lives in the future. Um, some of the um, points that you raised are really important ones about the jobs and, you know, education, inequality. 
all of these points, and I think the jury is still out about universal basic income, whether or not that actually is an effective policy tool and whether that actually um, addresses the, the issues or creates new ones. Of course, migration is a, is a major one as well. Um, and for us, increasingly also the question on of who is um, responsible, but also how do we create a responsiveness in society and in the leadership to listen to some of those people who are left behind who do not feel part of this. Because one of the big risks of this revolution, whatever you want to call it, is that it does create winners and losers, and it does concentrate power and resources with the big guys. Like, you know, it, on one hand, the, the technology firms, but also some of the big uh, economies who have the money and the resources to invest in it in the large scale. Uh, or then, you know, some of the smaller ones that are really nimble and, and innovative, but in, in general, it's the big guys that, that sort of look like the winners. And there was recent studies also done on who are the winners of globalization and why the China model actually was so, you know, successful in terms of ring, fences, ring fencing its industries and its economy. Um, but yeah, I think those questions are really central. And if we're taking this now back to the European view or the EU view, it, it will be extremely important to think through how Europe will really cement its global leadership role in these questions and what will be the position it takes. And in a way, we're facing a difficulty year ahead because of the elections, of course, in the Parliament, at the European Commission. And hopefully, it will not mean that we lose another year in Europe. Um, already with Brexit, we've wasted a lot of time, I would argue. Um, on some of the things, instead of addressing some of the bigger issues where Europe you know, could wake up in a couple of years completely left behind already now, when you look at m much of the data, Europe is not faring very well when it comes to investments uh, on education and science and tech, but also just startups, investments in really new, big, disruptive te technologies. It's not where others are in AI, in, in other things. So that, that's, that's what I would... Uh, Pavel, is the Industrial Revolution on the agenda for the summit in Sibiu in May 2019? Uh, I think it should be because the, the summit in Sibiu is about uh, the long-term orientation of the EU. Uh, but to be honest, I think technology will be very, very big in, in the next uh, cycle of the institutions, in the next commission. I mean, it's already big now, but, uh, but this will need to be scaled up very um, sizably. Um, and why? Because we are, we are often victims of the assumption that somehow it's only the democratic countries that can innovate. Um, that was our assumption 10 years ago, 20 years ago, that somehow there will be a division of labor in the world and, and us in the Western world will innovate and the others will replicate. Well, that is uh, blatantly not true any, uh, any longer, but not everyone has realized. Um, um, and, uh, and the Chinese, by throwing um, massive amounts of money at the problem, have uh, achieved spectacular results. Um, there are some areas where they haven't. Um, semiconductors is one of them for a specific reason which has to do with the semiconductor industry, namely that you have to be very, you have to be very fast. Uh, Moore's law applies in that field, and therefore you need to be really super quick in order to be ahead of your competitor. Um, and that's why, in spite of, again, huge uh, amounts of money being spent in China on this, they, they haven't reached the type of excellence which they've aspired to. But that's an exception to the rule. Uh, and what this means for us is that we need to do two things. One is uh, disruptive innovation, which we haven't done. I mean, 99.9% .9 of what we do from uh, EU funds is about incremental innovation. And of course, nothing wrong with incremental innovation, but, uh, but it's disruptive, which creates new markets. So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be active there. There is, there is an attempt with the European Innovation Council that is being launched, 2.7 billion euro uh, in the next, uh, for the next two years and uh, much more in, in the next financial framework. So that's the beginning. And the second thing is, is scaling up yeah, because, um, I mean, it's really big projects which, uh, which matter nowadays. So, uh, so things like supercomputing, where again, we are launching an initiative, all that needs to be scaled up uh, massively for Europe to be able to compete. Thank you very much. Uh, I now open the floor to uh, your questions, uh, comments, uh, and remarks. So microphones shall be there, yes. So uh, the gentleman there in, in the middle and then uh, in the front will take the questions at once. Hey. Hello, everyone. Thank you for 
the presentation. It's uh, a really, really good one, in fact. And uh, it's answered the many questions that I have before. However, um, we pointed a lot of things uh, when we talked about AI, big data, uh, cyborgs, in fact. <laughs> yeah, that's also that's a, a really important thing. And right now, what we are having, we have people talking about a new kingdom, the seventh kingdom, which is Technium. And this seventh kingdom, the explanation of it is the fact that there will be um, a, what we are calling cyborgs laser. I mean, where technology, in fact, can rule over humans. And we can see that in many incidents, even right now. Uh, for example, uh, may, there, were, there were, in fact, an incident where we had two robots creating their own language, and we had to shut them down. Uh, there were also, uh, we see self-driving cars respecting laws more than humans. And we see also uh, quantum technology, quantum computing, D-Wave, E-Wave. Um, however, the regulations there, and the, this is what uh, Ms. Larkin said, that our processes are right now really um, rigid, let's say, and we need to be more agile in our processes because um, let's say that the evolution of technology is really fast, crazy fast, let's say. Now, my question is, and there is a saying, in fact, that the, the US is inventing the, uh, the Asia. Asia, in fact, is uh, industrializing and the Europe, Europe is uh, regulating. So <laughs> my question to you guys is, what are we doing so that we will have a brighter future when we talk about technology, when we talk about artificial intelligence, when we talk about the evolution of artificial intelligence and how we can control in somehow ways the private sector in the invention sector, in the invention like area, especially we are talking about Amazon with like 50% only for invention of the budget. We can't even like compete with. Thank you. So that was that is my question. Thank you very much. And the gentleman in the front here, yes. Microphone right behind you. Thank you. Um Harry Theoharis, I'm a member of the Greek Parliament. I wanted to um connect the question of the technological uh, um, revolution to the political, to the democratic and perhaps even to the EU itself. Um you talked about how to make things faster or things are getting faster anyway, but um, do we want that? How do we explain this to the citizens that have legitimate fears? How do we mitigate the actual reality? Those fears are not necessarily irrational. Uh, how do we do that? Um, how do we deal with the delegit delegitimization of the human being as a decision maker? When the algorithm in AI knows you better than you, then the algorithm makes better decisions about you. Um, uh, than yourself. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, uh, we assumed that China could not um, uh, innovate as uh, quickly or as uh, uh, successfully as uh, democracies, but we live in the age of big data, and now concentration is uh, um, an advantage not diffusion as it used to be in order to create more value and in order to do that. So it's not just about China, it's also about Alphabet, it's also about Apple, it's also about those things. And EU um, uh, is, has, has not even dealt on the political level very well with those issues necessarily. The lack of political integration means that we cannot deal with the technological concentration in such a way. And But on the other hand, Countries cannot even do that. We've seen Verstager, Commissioner Verstager, fine Apple for 13 billion, and Ireland, who is to um, collect the money, saying no. So clearly, the solution is not countries, as, as the populists are saying. Thank you very much. So, um, in the absence of further questions, for the time being, we'll uh, we'll we'll go back to the uh, to the panel. And as a matter of fact, I mean, both the questions are uh, in a way uh, somewhat somewhat connected. I mean, the first question is. Is technology too fast for our own uh, processes, our own legal process? And this very much goes back to the question of regulation. 
uh, that that the discussion of regulation that we were uh, that we were having, and also the control and the link with the uh, with the, the private sector. And then uh, the, the second question, which I find very uh, very interesting, and which links to lots of issues such as uh, such as education, uh, as well, is also how uh, as, as politicians uh, we have a responsibility to explain this uh, to to our citizens, and you know who are the actors who can actually, in a way, explain uh, the advances uh, that we are seeing. So, who would like um, to go first? Because these are very complex questions. Yes, Carl Bildt. Thank you. Well, I can start at least some of them. Are things going too fast? Um, I think probably people have thought that since the age of Pericles. Um, that um, a slower pace of life would be more convenient. But we don't have much of a choice. It's racing ahead. But you should ask this question not in this particular panel or in this audience, because we are, old, um, we are all fairly old here. If you talk to the sort of the 12 years old or the 14 years old, they won't understand what you're talking about because they're living in a different world where this for them is the way things are. And they are already behaving in slightly different ways from what we do. And we have a huge digital divide opening up in the world that is not a geographic one, it's generational. Parents and children live in different worlds, but they adapt to that particular world and they will adapt the word to how they see it. Will democracy, I think democracy will prevail, but will our political system see the same, be the same 30, 40 years down the line? Yeah, perhaps not, but I'm, not quite, I, I'm quite certain that the generation that we shape it will then shape it according to the new experience that they will have in, in, the, in the digital life. On the regulation, how do you regulate all of these particular things? We can, that's an endless discussion. Just one aspect on the European thing that worries me. Pablo mentioned GDPR. I'm, I'm only in favor of privacy um, and, and the attempt that has been done. I'm, I'm fairly critical of GDPR because it's become very complicated. Uh, I, I, I can't get a list of the email and telephone addresses to the parents of the, in the same class as my son, because that is now prohibited by GDPR. Well, privacy protection, well, fine, but, but there should be limit to that as well. And what I've also seen is that the, the sort of the Facebooks and the Apples and the Amazons, if those are the ones that we worry primarily about, they can throw thousands of lawyers at this, thousands of lawyers, and handle it. But the startup in Sweden or Estonia or Poland, who's trying to beat them to the game, can't throw lawyers at the issues. So we are, in, as an attempt to do something which I basically support, there's a risk of us strengthening the hold of the big ones and restricting the possibilities of the startup ones. Um, Final comment on these jobs and what's happening in inequality, which is um, a very important debate. I see inequality increasing in Sweden. Um, because we now have, to an extent we've never had before, billionaires. Billionaires, in dollar terms. We probably had that before, but I wasn't aware of it. Uh, but now we have them. And, and, and some of them look like they are homeless. Um, and they are sort of 27 years old. Uh, or whatever they could be, and they have made tons and tons and tons and tons of money uh, in a very quick period of time. Uh, so our inequality statistics looks bizarre at the moment. The good thing with these guys, I would say, is that they don't necessarily spend it on luxury yachts. They spend it on other startups. They, they're investing like crazy in all sorts of new endeavors all over. Um, and the biggest problem that we have in Sweden today, I would say, is we have an acute lack of manpower. We can't find enough people, engineers, programmers, uh, to do everything that needs to be done for the economic development. And uh, that goes also to the discussion, are jobs going to lose? If you take the correlation between those countries that have the widest employment of industrial robots to take that, uh, that's South Korea, that's Sweden, that's Germany. Those are the countries that have the lowest unemployment. Um, is that a correlation that is direct? I don't know. Um, but I can certainly say that those that have gone faster 
in the introduction of these technologies don't seem to be suffering in terms of employment prospects so far. Will that be different 50 years down the road? I don't think so, but no one can guarantee. Thank you very much. Uh, I think based on Carl Bildt's uh, proposal, I will s uh, contact BuzzFeed and offer them to do a quiz, uh, homeless or millionaire. Uh, that will certainly be very, uh, very interesting. Uh, but you also mentioned, uh, humorous note aside, uh, labor and the, the, the lack of manpower. And I see uh, Pavel von Chekhovsky who wants to who wants to speak. And it, this makes me think that you mentioned labor and you mentioned low employment rates. Well. The four uh, V4 countries are among the countries in Europe that have the lowest employment rates, but also are lacking the most uh, in, in labor. And perhaps this is a problem that may get more acute uh, as we see the effects uh, of, uh, of, of the fourth industrial revolution. But please, uh, Pavel, uh, the, the floor is yours. Well, in, in our countries, it's, we're not there yet, okay, in terms of uh, so-called uh, technological unemployment, uh, far away from that. But uh, the questions were asked about uh, pretty much the same, about uh, losing control. What we do about it? One issue about losing control because robots would do some harm. And even in the European Parliament, in the communique, in the, in the writing, if you can read this, there is mention about so-called the first Asimov rule. First Asimov rule is robot doesn't hurt human. Of course, the second and third is about this, the same story. So the issue here is what type of uh, mitigation effect, regulation effect we put uh, to, um, to make it happen, to make sure that we are not hurt by robots because they lose control. Another issue, of course, related to uh, this question from, from, uh, from the Greek uh, uh, MP, uh, it's an issue of, um, of uh, response to uh, communication about, about uh, what is happening because of those fears that people have. And that's, that's a very important question because uh, this displacement of workers, disruption of the labor market, all the fears uh, and, uh, and how we want to mitigate, but also the issues which we're not discussed today, but they should be in the security conference touched, uh, the cyber crime. Also, going to the Internet of Things today, it's not cybercrime just somewhere else, you know, but it's actually happening. And other issues of uh, activity of, we call it, non-state actors, you know, taking control over and uh, drones, for example, you know. So there are security concerns, there is an issue of uh, transfer of technology, diffusion of technology that has to be controlled. And I understand this is about uh, uh, the accusation maybe the EU is doing too much regulation uh, in your question, but in fact we have to regulate. We have no options because it's not about you know ethics only. It's about uh, uh, rule of uh, law. It's about uh, uh, rules. The you know the playground in which we can benefit, but no, but no harm. Thank you very much, Brussels Pavel. I don't think we should get uh, very paranoid about losing control over uh, technology because um, at, at the end of the day, computing remains a physical process. Um, so you can you can pull the plug if you want to. Um, what 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 is important, however, uh, is to make sure that people feel secure using technology. Um, and uh, and with respect to uh, um, the algorithms in particular, I think there are two ways of going about it. Um, either you give people the opportunity to call for an algorithmic audit, and that applies more to the private sector, or you introduce an equivalent of algorithmic impact assessment before um, the algorithm is, is being used by a public institution. I think the latter is better for the public sector, which does use algorithms uh, on a big scale already more in the US than in Europe, but it's coming as well. So that's where we should do algorithmic impact assessment in order to study what um, the results will be. Um, but for activities of the private sector, it's more that people should have recourse to some type of audit of the impact of algorithms if they feel that there is a risk of um, unfairness. Um, you mentioned uh, big data in one of the uh, questions, and I think we shouldn't forget that in Europe we have an ample volume of, of data, more in the industry, uh, more in the public sector than, than somewhere else, and, and we should um, 
we should use uh, we should use it more more effectively. And if I have one regret um, about these uh, Swedish uh, newborn uh, billionaires, it is a regret that we haven't been able to extract more value from data. I mean, people tend to give their valuables, uh, their, their, their essential data almost for free in order to get uh, these relatively no-brainer type of uh, advantages uh, with location of nearest restaurants, etc. Um, and this is where, you know, this is at the heart of the business model of the big tech companies, of course. Um, there are some attempts to, to introduce the notion of uh, the value of personal data. Uh, some utilities give, uh, give additional advantages um, for data, but, uh, but it's just the beginning. I think uh, one of the questions for the future will be how to extract more value from data for uh, the consumers, for the citizens. Thank you. Martina, do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, on the speed of technology or the technological development, I think what is maybe more important or certainly just as important is not necessarily speed and how fast it progresses, but in what direction. And that we really have a better grip on where it's heading and that we feel it's actually benefiting large parts of society rather than just a few um, parts of society or the economy. Um, the question on, on uh, most of the questions I think have been answered very, very eloquently, but the, the question on the business um, sector control or how we really make sure that the business sector is involved in this, um, I think you know, one has to understand that this new world is all about complexity, complexity and interdependence and interconnectedness and no individual part of society, whether that's government or civil society, whatever, or business can, can go with alone. So it is absolutely important that the business sector works with government and policymakers to design this new framework of how the world should and, and could look like and take responsibility. I think a common theme that all of us have said, this aspect of each player in this needs to take much more responsibility about what this look, world looks like in a really, you know, a much more mature way than perhaps in the past where we just sort of had these winners and losers and, and you know, the best prevails. Um, and, and really think through what, what globalization will look like in the future to come back to the original theme and what is the role of these various actors and how can they be responsive and responsible in their actions uh, towards society and involve them and, and really look at larger progress in the future. All right. Thank you very much. So, unfortunately, we are uh, running out of time. If I speak longer, I will get yelled at uh, by the by the organizers. But I, I, I just want to to finish with uh, leaving us with a couple a couple thoughts. In the presidential election in France in, in 2017, Benoit Hamon, the, the candidate from the Socialist Party, which was one of the main parties in France, actually was built his whole campaign around the taxation uh, of robots and is, a matter of fact, uh, trying to test uh, the universal basic income uh, in certain regions uh, of France. So there is a very big question also about the political forces in our EU countries that will be talking uh, about, these, uh, about these issues. This is the, the first thing I wanted to, to mention for, uh, to, to, to leave you. The second thing, just uh, some tweetable tidbits uh, that, we can, that we can remember uh, from this. Uh, I think that the notion of talentism versus capitalism is one that is you know, easy to remember and that we can certainly uh, integrate in our, uh, in our daily thinking. And then I think really this panel evolved, revolved very much around the regulation uh, of, of data and the important role that the EU can play is a, is, is a norm setter uh, in this. And then you know, I very much like this idea of digital uh, defense that uh, Carl Bild uh, brought, brought forward or the, the issue of extracting more value uh, from, uh, from the data, which the European Union, or at least the companies that are based in the European Union, uh, haven't been doing. And of course, given that we are uh, in Poland, I cannot but uh, also uh, help you to continue to think uh, about how um, transformation or the fourth industrial revolution will certainly mean something different 
in France than it can mean uh, in the uh, in the Czech Republic. And as a matter of fact, this is uh, something that the, the European Union will continue to be uh, working on uh, in the very near future. So uh, thank you very much uh, for being here today. Thank you very much for uh, listening to this very interesting discussion. As I was afraid of one hour for this is nearly not enough. It would probably deserve a whole, uh, a whole conference. So uh, thank you to all of you and thank you to our panelists for being here today.